Hey grade 12s and welcome to question 7 of this paper. So 7.1 says determine f prime of x from first principles if f of x is equal to negative 2x squared plus x. Okay, so we have to determine the derivative of this from first principles. You can start off with finding the equation of f of x plus h. So this just means that wherever you see x, you're going to replace that with x plus h. So this is equal to, we have a negative 2, and then we see x. So we replace that with x plus h, and that will be all squared. Then again, plus x, so we'll say plus x plus h. And then let's just expand and foil. So we're going to have first just a negative 2 because this whole bracket is being squared. So then we will have, you can just work with it like this instead. We're going to take x and we're going to square it and we have x squared. Then we multiply the first and the second term and that will give us xh. Then you take that and multiply that by 2. So that will give you a positive 2xh. Then we have plus the last term squared, h squared, close bracket, plus x plus h. And then we can go ahead and just multiply the negative 2 into this bracket. So we will have negative 2x squared and then a negative 4xh, then a negative 2h squared plus x plus h. So just be very careful as you're working with this. You see it is five marks and this is really where you can score marks. And now to find the derivative. So the derivative is f prime of x is equal to the limit of h tending to zero or approaching zero. And then we have f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Okay, remember this is really just the gradient formula. It's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's where it comes from. And so we're saying this is equal to the limit as h approaches 0. And then we have the equation of f of x plus h. And the equation of f of x plus h that we have is all of this. So we just rewrite everything very carefully and just make sure that you're not missing anything. So to x so h squared plus x plus h. Then we have to minus this by the equation of f of x. And you see that f of x has two terms. So you need to include brackets first. And then you put in that equation. So that's negative 2x squared plus x all over our h. Then now this negative is going to multiply into that expression with two terms. So rewrite everything again carefully. Don't also forget to keep writing the limit as h approaches 0 up until you substitute h as 0. So when we're multiplying in, this negative multiplies to this negative and becomes a positive. So now we have a positive 2x squared. And then this negative is multiplying to this positive x, making a negative x all over the h that we have. Now, the one thing you should notice here is that what you are subtracting by these values, this is usually what's going to cancel across all of this. So because I see a positive 2x squared, I know somewhere there must be a negative 2x squared. And there it is. So negative 2x squared will cancel with a positive 2x squared. And then I have a negative x here. So I know somewhere I must have a positive x. So there's the positive x cancelling with that negative x. And so we are left with Again, we have to say the limit as h approaches 0, then we have negative 4xh and then minus 2h squared plus h all over h. Then lastly, we take h out as a common factor because we cannot substitute in h as 0 because that will make this undefined. And so that's the whole point of doing this. So as h approaches 0, we're saying h out as a common factor. And then we will have in here what is left. So take this and divide it by the h. The h's will cancel. You'll be left with negative 4x. Take this as well, the second term, divided by h. The h squared, one of the h's cancel, and you're left with negative 2h. And then this positive h divided by h will be a positive 1 all over the h. Then this two h's can cancel. Then we have, again, 
the limit. You can rewrite this, but it's not really necessary. You can just choose to just substitute at this point. So now I'm going to substitute in place of h. So I'm just going to say negative 4x minus 2. And then in place of h, I'm just saying 0 plus 1. And so f prime of x is equal to negative 4x. That becomes a 0. And then that becomes plus 1. One, as we just have it like that and so that is that so just be very careful with this remember it is five marks so it's really a place that you can score marks so moving on to 7.2 7.2.1 says that we have to determine the derivative of this function so this is also a thing where you have to remember the way the notation of these things work first of all let's look at the function and see is this ready to be derived well we have assert with x on the denominator you see assert is not the problem it's only a problem where there is an x in that third then it needs to be changed in a way that it's not a third but instead its ex exponent is a rational number so we're going to have to change that first and then still move it to the numerator because we shouldn't have any x in the denominator so right now that seems like the only problem okay so what i'm going to do is we're going to keep writing this as is equal to dx and we're going to just simplify so as long as you're not deriving yet you're going to keep writing is equal to dx and so we have the negative 5x on top which is fine and we're going to change the third and so you're going to have the base of x and now you have to just think about the exponent on top of the x is an invisible one and the exponent behind this radical, the square root, is actually an invisible 2 because it's a square root. That's why with the cube root, you have a 3 here instead. And so to make this exponent a rational number, you keep the base and you say the inside exponent over the outside exponent. So that's 1 over 2. And then we have the minus x squared over 5. And then we can go ahead and take this to the numerator because it shouldn't be on the denominator. When you take this to the numerator because it has an x in it, the exponent is going to become negative. So again, we're still writing dx because we are not deriving yet. So we have negative 5x. And then that x is going to come to the numerator and it's being multiplied now by the x. And the exponent now becomes negative. So negative 1 over 2. I'd like to also add that instead of taking that x to the numerator, what we could have done is just divided the x's. So we see that we have an x here, and it's actually raised to the power of an invisible 1. And we have an x to the power of a half. So if the bases are the same and you're dividing, you would just subtract the exponents. So it's like saying the 1 minus the half. So we have x to the power of a half instead. So that's something else you could have done. And then this, there's also a way you can rewrite this just in a way that it will be easier for you to derive it. In front of the x squared, there is an invisible one. So I'm going to write that invisible one. And so this is really what I can write this as. I can write this as minus 1 over 5 x to the power of 2. Because that x is on the numerator, and this x is also on the numerator, I can choose to write it with the 1 or away from the 1 because it's really like multiplied by x over 1. So if we had to put it back, it's the 1 or the negative 1 times the x squared, which will give you the negative 1x squared over the 5 times the 1, which gives you the 5. So I can write it just like that. We can go ahead and simplify this part. So we have is equal to, again, I still have to say dx because I'm not deriving yet. Then we're saying the negative 5, and now the x and the x. When the bases are the same and we are multiplying, you need to add the exponents. The exponent on top of this x is an invisible 1. And so when you're adding the exponents, it's like saying 1 plus negative a half. And if you say 1 plus negative a half, you see that that positive and that negative will just multiply, giving you 1 minus a half. So here we're just going to have x to the power of that 1 minus a half and of course that is going to give you a half so we don't have to rewrite another line again so that gives you just a half and then we can continue and we're going to have minus 1 over 5 x squared and now this is ready to be derived so we're going to take the coefficient and multiply it to the exponent so that is a negative 5 
times a half. And you see the numerator times the numerator, that is going to be a negative 5. And then the denominator, which is really just a 1, multiplied by 2 will give you a 2. So we have negative 5 over 2 there. We have negative 5 over 2. And then we have x. And then we have to say a half minus 1. So if you take a half minus 1, you're going to get negative a half. And then we have, again, we're taking the coefficient and multiplying it by the exponent. Negative 1 over 5 times 2 will give you negative 2 over 5. And we have x, and then that 2 minus 1 just gives you 1. But we don't have to write the 1 here because there's an invisible 1. That is the 1 that is left. And now we are done with this. So now you can just rewrite this in a way that this negative a half is positive. So this exponent of x. So we can write this like this. The 5 is on the top. This is also on the numerator. So we can take it to the denominator so that its exponents can become positive. So we're going to have the negative 5 all over 2. And now we have x to the power of positive a half minus 2 over 5x. Or if you like, you can write this as 2x over 5. It's still going to be correct. So there we go. That's the derived form of that. Moving on to 7.2.2. And now 7.2.2, we have, we have to determine the derivative of this function. Okay, so there's something I want you to notice about this function. Look at the first term in this first bracket. We have x, and then we also have x here. And then we have a 2 over x, and we also have a 2 over x here. So notice that first and the second term are both the same. The only difference is that we have a plus here and a minus here. Okay, so that should remind you of difference of two squares. Because difference of two squares would work like this. If you have x minus 2, and then an x plus 2, or let me put it in the same order. So if you have an x plus 2 and an x minus 2, if you want to simplify this, instead of foiling out, there's no use of doing that. It is difference of two squares. You have to just identify that it is. Then all you're going to have to do is multiply the first two terms, and that will become x squared, and multiply the last two terms, and that will be negative 4. So that, it's going to simplify like that, even if you had foiled out. So that's what we're going to do to these ones as well. So, so we're saying it's equal to d over dx because we have not derived yet. We're not deriving yet. And we open a bracket and now we are saying the x multiplied by the x. And that will give you an x squared. And then the positive 2 over x multiplied by the negative 2 over x. So the numerators and the numerators would multiply. Remember, it's a positive times negative, which gives you a minus. And then we have 2 times 2 giving you a 4 over the x times the x giving you an x squared. So this is what we have so long. And then look at this and ask yourself, is this ready to be derived? Well, no, it's not ready to be derived because we still have an x on the denominator. So we need to take it to the numerator. But when you take it to the numerator, it will cause that exponent to become negative. So what we're going to have is we still have the d over dx because we're not deriving it. And then we have the x squared, which is okay. Then minus 4, and now that comes to the numerator and becomes x to the power of a negative 2. And now this is ready to be derived. So deriving this, now I'm just going to say is equal to, I'm not going to rewrite that. So the x squared, the coefficient of x is an invisible one. Multiplied by the exponent will give you 2. Then we have x, and we have to say 2 minus 1, which is 1. And so it's an invisible one. I don't have to write the 1. Then the coefficient of x to the power of negative 2 is negative 4. Multiplied by the exponent of negative 2 is positive 8. And we have x to the power of negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. So you can just rewrite this in a way that the exponent is positive. So this will just be we have the 2x plus we have just the 8. The 8, it doesn't have a problem. The exponent is not negative. It's the x that needs to go to the denominator. So over x to the power of a positive 3. And so that would be your derived function. Okay, now we move on to question 8. So question 8 says, the sketch below represents the function f of x is equal to x cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d and g of x is equal to ax squared plus q. 
The points A, which is over here, B, which is to a negative 16 over there, and C are points where the two graphs intersect, so those three points. Then C, 6 and 0, is an intercept of F, while L and M are turning points of F. Okay, so we have that point over there. The first question is to show that B is equal to negative 5, C equals negative 8, and D equals 12, if it is given that F prime of X is equal to this. Okay, so they want us to determine the values of B, C, and D if they're giving us the derivative of this function. So remember, they gave us the original of this function as this. So let me just rewrite that. So they gave us the original of this function, but then they're also telling us that it is given that f prime of x is equal to this. So if they're giving us the derivative of this function, how about we derive this one as well? And that way we'll be able to match the coefficient of x squared with the coefficient of x squared, the coefficient of x with that one as well, and the constant with this one. So if we derive this, f prime of x is equal to so we're going to have the coefficient of 1, the invisible 1 here, times the 3, which gives you 3x. And then 3 minus 1 is 2, so squared. Then we have this coefficient of x, which is positive b times 2, and that gives us a positive 2b. Then we have x to the power of 2 minus 1, and 2 minus 1 is 1. We don't have to write that one. And then we have positive c times the invisible exponent of 1 on top of that x. And that will just give us a positive c. Then, of course, the x also has an exponent of 1, an invisible exponent of 1. And we have to take out a 1 from that minus 1. And that is now going to become 0. And anything to the power of 0 gives you 1. So that became a 1. And so the c multiplied by the 1 will just give you the c. Then D, D is a constant because it doesn't have an X in it. It's the only value here without a variable. So that becomes zero when it's derived. Okay, so when we derive this, this is what we get. So if you compare this with this, notice that the coefficient of X squared over here and x squared over here, they're exactly the same, 3 and 3, which is fine. And so since these two equations are really the same thing, they're both the derived versions of the f equation of this. So we're going to equate this, the coefficient of x, which is negative 10. We're going to equate it with the coefficient of x here, which is positive 2b. So we're saying we have 2b, and we're going to equate that with the negative 10. And we're also going to take the constant here of the f prime of x and the constant of the f prime of x. And we're going to equate those. So c is equal to the negative 8. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve for b here. We'll divide both sides by 2. And so b is equal to negative 5. So this is the value of b and that's the value of c. So we have b and c. We just have to find d. D was in the original equation. So let's put these back into the original equation so that we can find D. So we're going to have F of X is equal to X cubed. Then we have plus B X squared, but it's a negative five. So we say minus five X squared plus C, but we have negative eight, so negative eight X and then plus D. So because D is the only thing missing, if we just have a point that we substitute in place of x and y, we can find d. So let's go ahead and see what point do we have on this graph. As you can see, we have a point b, 2 and negative 16. You also have this 6 and 0. But I'll just go with this one. So 2 and negative 16. I'm going to substitute this into this equation, 2 and negative 16. So I'm saying f of 2, because this is an x value I'm substituting, is equal to 2 all cubed minus 5 times 2 all squared minus 8 times 2 plus d. And so if 2 is the x value, we know that negative 16 is the y value. So in place of f of 2, I'm saying negative 16 as the y value is equal to. Now, you would notice that all of these are numbers. All, everything over here is a number. So you could just put everything here onto the calculator. Then we have the plus d. And when I put everything onto the calculator, I get a negative 28, so negative 28. And then I have the plus D. So you see, this is just an equation we have to solve for D. So I'm going to take negative 28 over, 
and it becomes a positive 28. And we still have the minus 16 minus 16 is equal to D. So what's positive 28 minus 16? And so that gives us 12. So D is equal to 12. And there we have found everything. We found the value of B, C, and D. Okay, moving on to the next question. The next question, 8.2 says, determine the coordinates of the turning points L and M of F. And remember, this is for five marks. So this is really a place that you can score marks. So these are turning points. It's the points L and M. When you're thinking about the turning point of a function, this is the point where the gradient, okay, the gradient of this function is equal to zero. And that's why they're called stationary points. At this point, they're neither increasing nor decreasing. They're just stationary so they're where this function has a gradient equal to zero. So how do we find the gradient of the function? You find the gradient of the function by deriving the function. When we derive the function, that is finding the gradient at any point. So we're going to derive this function and we know this stands for the gradient. So we're going to make this gradient equal to zero. Okay, now the good thing about this is that we already have the derivative of f. They told us the derivative of f when they told us it was given that f prime of x was equal to this. So we can just rewrite this equation and set it equal to zero. So here's the function. And so this is the gradient itself, the gradient function. So we set it equal to zero and we have 3x squared minus 10x minus 8. So now we have to factorize this. Now you could use the quadratic formula, but you will lose one mark for not including your factors. So I'm going to actually just factorize this like the way it should be factorized. We have 3x squared minus 10x minus 8. Notice there is no common factor here. So we have to just factorize this. So there's a method I use, it's called the cross method. So I'm going to take the factors of the first term. The first term is 3x squared. So what times what gives you 3x squared? And that would just be 3x multiplied by x. And then you look at the last term and we're going to ask what times what will give us this last term. So the factors of the last term. And that can be 4 and 2. It can be 8 and 1. But you have to really think about it like this. If you used 8 and 1, is that really going to help you to get the middle term? Even if you said 3 times 1, that would just give you a 3x. The 3x and 8x times 8, that would just give you an 8x. And you can see, even if you added these together, they would give you an 11x. It's not 10x in any way. So I know those factors aren't going to work. So I'm going to try 4 and 2. But you now need to put them in a way that it will work. Also remember, 8 is negative, meaning one of the factors have to be negative, the other has to be positive, because that's the only way you can get a negative 8. So I could put a 4, I could put a 2 here, but I would just have to test and see if it's going to work. So if I say 3x multiplied by 2, that's going to give you a 6x, and x multiplied by 4, that's going to give you a 4x. And these two, remember, one of it has to have a minus. This is definitely not going to give you 10. So instead of putting as 4 and 2, I'm going to put it as 2 and 4. So look at what we get. 3x times 4, that is 12x. And then x times 2, that is 2x. Now think about it. You have 12x and you have 2x. But in the middle, we need to have a negative 10x. So how can we form negative 10x knowing that one of this has to be negative, one has to be positive? Well, if you said negative 12x plus 2x, then that would give you a negative 10x. And that is the middle term. So how you know what signs your factors should get? Because the negative is in front of the 12x, how did we form 12x? We formed it by saying 3x times 4x. So for this to be negative, the negative must have been by the negative by the 4. So that is 3x times negative 4, which gives you negative 12x. And then the positive would be here. And so these would be your factors. So if you want to learn how to use this method to factorize trinomials, you can check out this video on my channel. So if you don't want to use the quadratic and you feel that it is worth losing one mark, then it's okay. You would still get, it would just be one mark lost there. So your factors are, you take the factors like this. These are your two factors. So the factors are 3x plus 2 and x minus 4. And that is equal to 0.
And now we just have to solve for x. So solving for x, we're just going to say 3x plus 2 is equal to 0 or x minus 4 is equal to 0. 3x is equal to take the 2 over. It becomes a negative 2. Divide both sides of the equation by 3x is equal to negative 2 over 3. Or we have x is equal to take the negative 4 over 4. Okay, so remember, we're just trying to find the turning points of L and M. Right now, we have the x values of their turning points. We need the full coordinates. So we need to get the y values as well. So to get the y value of this x value, you will not substitute it into this formula. This formula is for your gradient. This is the gradient of that cubic function. You're going to take this and substitute it into the original formula so you can get the y value belonging to this x value. So just substitute negative 2 into this. So I'm just going to say f of negative 2 and I'm not going to write it down. I'm just going to substitute it on the calculator. And I'm not really going to write down how I substitute it because if I got the y value, it must mean that I did substitute. So I don't think you need to really show that. Okay, so we get 400 over 27. It's best to leave it as a fraction rather than a decimal because if you leave it as a decimal, it's going to be rounded off. So 400 over 27, that's the first one. Then you have to get the y value of this 4. So f of 4 in place of x, also just substitute 4. And when we substitute 4, we get negative 36. So negative 36. Okay, so let's just see which one belongs to which one. Because we have the coordinates now. We have the coordinates negative 2 over 3 and 400 over 27. And we also have the other one, which is 4 and negative 36 now. Okay, so we have the x and the y coordinates. But let's just see what they belong to. So because we had negative 2 over 3, negative 2 over 3 must be the L because these are stationary points we're referring to. This must be the one for the L and then that must be the M. So this one takes L and that one takes M. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so that is a total of five marks. But if you do, of course, skip the factorizing of that, um, you would get four marks there. Okay, now moving on to 8.3. So 8.3, we have to determine the equation of G. Okay, so let's go back to the graph and see what we have from the graph of G. So as you can see, the graph of G, we have this point A, we have the point B. If we keep moving, you see we have the point C. So since we have two points on this graph, we can determine its equation. So we have B as 2 and negative 16, C as 6 and 0. So let's put down those points. Okay, and I like to put the points under each other because it's easier to just find the gradient like this. So we first have to find the gradient so that we can find the C as well. So M is equal to Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. And so this will be equal to our Y2. We can just go ahead and say, even if you said the top minus the bottom, it will still work out. You just have to be consistent as well with the X. You must also say top minus bottom. So I'm just going to say negative 16 minus 0 and then 2 minus 6. So over 2 minus 6. And we're going to get a negative 16 over a negative 4. So the gradient is positive 4. Okay, so now we have the gradient. We just have to find the equation of the line. There are two equations you can use. You can use the y is equal to mx plus c, but I like to use this equation. y minus y1 is equal to m bracket x minus x1 because I feel like it's quicker. I don't have to first find c, then substitute c back in. So it still works like this one. You just have to find the gradient, put the gradient in, and you need to substitute one point. So I'm going to choose the point C. And if we substitute this, we're going to have, but you just need to know that we are substituting it like this. Your X1, that's going to be your six. And your Y1, that's going to be your zero. Okay, the Y and the X, those ones are just going to be like your Y and your X here. So we're going to have, y minus our y1 is the 0 is equal to our gradient is 4 and then open bracket x minus our x1 is 6 and even if you use this you would still get the same thing 
So this is just y because y minus 0 is still y is equal to and we multiply in at 4x and then 4 times negative 6 is negative 24. So this is the equation of g. So I can write it as g of x is equal to because they didn't really say write it in any way. They just want the equation of g. So it's equal to 4x minus 24. OK, moving on to the next question. OK, now we are on 8.4 and 8.4 says if it is given that the coordinates of A are x and negative 36, determine the length of AM. OK, so let's go ahead and see that A. So the coordinates of A, they're saying that is x and negative 36. We have to determine the length of A till M. Okay, what were the coordinates of M? We found that already. The coordinates of M was 4 and negative 36. So 4 and negative 36. So if you look at that coordinate and we look at the fact that this one is X and negative 36, notice that they have the same Y value. So this Y value of here, negative 36, they have the exact same Y value. Think about it like this. Look at your X axis. Your x-axis, every point that lies on the x-axis is an x-intercept. And so they all have the same y-value but different x-values, meaning they all lie on a perfectly horizontal line. So I'm just saying if this point over here was something like 2 or 1, and I know that this one is 6, to calculate the distance from here to here, I would just have to calculate and say 6 minus 1 because it's like going from 1 and going 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I'm counting all the way to 6 and I'll find out, okay, from here to here is actually 5 units. That's how we'll calculate the length of a horizontal line. This line is a horizontal line because they have the same y value. So to calculate its length, we just need to know what is the x value belonging to A and if we also know, we know this one, the x value belonging to m. And if we take this, it's always the bigger one minus the smaller one, like x2 minus x1. So if we take this and we subtract it by the x value over here, we will find the distance of that line. Again, it's just like saying I have this x value over here. And I also have this x value over here. If I want to find out what the length of that is, we're really just calculating like counting on all the way to that point over there. So we just have to say this x value minus that x value. But the thing is that we do not have this x value of A. So we need to find that x value of A. Luckily, the A is on the cubic function but it's also on the straight line. It's a point of intersection, one of the points of intersection of the cubic function and the straight line. So if we substitute, we know the y value of it. If we substitute that y value into the straight lines equation, we will find its x value and then we'll be able to find the distance of the line. So let's go ahead and do that. We have the equation of g of x and we're going to substitute that into the y value. Okay, so that's why the thing with functions and in maths in general, the previous question usually has a lot to do with the next question. So this is the g of x, but in place of g of x, in place of y, I'm going to say negative 36. And that is equal to, um, we we'll say 4x minus 24. So because the 4x is positive, I'm just going to take the negative 24 over and that becomes positive now. So it's positive 24 minus the 36 is equal to 4x. Okay, so if you say 24 minus 36, we get negative 12. Negative 12 is equal to 4x. Divide both sides by 4. Therefore, x would be equal to negative 3. Okay, so we have the x value now. Okay, now that we have the x value, let's go ahead and put it in here. So a is actually negative 3 and negative 36. And to find the distance of this horizontal line, we know this is 4. That's the x value belonging to m. And we know the x value belonging to a is negative 3. So we can just say the 4 minus the negative 3. You could have also just calculated it like this. You could have said if you're looking at the distance from the origin to negative 3, that's just 3 units. 
And if you're looking at the distance from the origin to the four, that's just four units. So three units plus four units is seven units. Okay, so that's how we find AM. So we can go ahead and say that AM is equal to the four minus negative three, which is really just four plus three, which is equal to seven units. So that is the answer of the length of AM because it's a horizontal line. Okay, moving on to the next question. And then 8.5, 8.5.1, we have for which value or values of X is the graph of F increasing? So when you want to check if something is increasing or decreasing, you have to read it from left to right. For example, we have this line to determine whether it's increasing or decreasing. If you look at it from the left hand side to the right hand side, what is it doing? Notice that moving from left to right, it is moving up. So this line is increasing. And if you looked at this line, you also have to read it from the left to right, like you read a book. So you're going to look at it and see from left to right, it is decreasing. Now this works the same with curves. If we looked at the cubic function and we're trying to see what is it doing at certain points, notice what is happening over here. Let's actually talk about first where it is not increasing or decreasing. This happens at the stationary points. At this point, the function is neither increasing nor decreasing. That's why the gradient at this point is zero. So let's read this from left to right. Over here in this part, and let me highlight this part, this part of the graph, what is this graph, this part of the graph doing? Reading from left to right, this part is increasing. And then here, it stops increasing or decreasing. It just stays still. It stays stationary. Then we see that over here, it starts to decrease. And then here, it stops increasing or decreasing. It just stays stationary. Then lastly, here, it starts to increase. Okay, and remember, we just have to determine the values of x for which it does this. So let's look at our graph that we have, the cubic function, and see how we can find this. But also just take note that the stationary points are a very important point to determine where it's increasing and decreasing. So we'll put that down as well. So this is our graph. This is the first, this is one of the stationary points we have. And we also have the stationary point of L. And let me just put that point down. That was the negative 2 over 3 and the 400 over 27. I think that was it. Okay, so yes, those are the stationary points. So they want to know where this graph is increasing. This graph is going to be increasing when we look at it from left to right. Over here, it is increasing. Then it stops increasing or decreasing. Then over here, it's decreasing. And then here, we have it increasing again. So now we just have to determine the values of x for which these that belong to these parts of the graph. And this is why I say the stationary points are going to be very important here. So if we're looking at this, let's look at what the x value of the stationary point is over here. The x value belonging to this stationary point is the negative 2 over 3. You see that the graph is increasing all the way here on these highlighted in blue parts. So look at the x values that belong to it. Its values here and here and here. And you have to compare that. You have to compare these values with this negative 2 over 3. So these are values that are what than negative 2 over 3. These are values that are less than negative 2 over 3. So one of the places where it's increasing is where x is less than negative 2 over 3. Remember, you cannot say or equal to negative 2 over 3 because at negative 2 over 3 is a stationary point. There it is neither increasing nor decreasing. So that's the first one. Then we can also look at the other part of the graph. So first mark the stationary point. The stationary point is at 4. That is the x value. Then we're going to mark all the places that are highlighted. We're going to line those places up to the x axis. So that is over here and here. And it keeps going. And now compare these x values that we have over here to 4. These are values that are what than 4? These are values that are greater than 4. So this is where x is greater than 4. 
So those will be the two solutions for this question where it's increasing. So we're going to say where x is less than negative 2 over 3 and it also happens where x is greater than 4. Okay, so this can be where x is less than negative 2 over 3 or where x is greater than 4. And then the last question. And then the last question in question 8 is for which value or values of x is the graph of f concave down? Okay, so when we talk about concavity or concavity, this is just basically how curved the graph is. When we have a parabola that looks like this, we call this a concave up parabola. We say it's concave up. When you have a parabola that looks like that, you say that that is concave down. So we also have the same type of patterns in the cubic function as well. If your cubic function looks like this, so look at the part that is concave down. It would be here. That part is curved down. And then the part that is concave up would be here. But now we need to know how do we actually answer them in terms of x. To answer them in terms of x, you need the point of inflection. Because the point of inflection is where this cubic function will change its concavity. So that's where it changes from concave down to concave up. So first thing you need to do, you need to find that point of inflection. So we can actually tell them, okay, we have to answer them in terms of x. So we need to know what the x value of the point of inflection is. So to find the x value of the point of inflection, you have to get the second derivative of the function and make it equal to zero. So the good thing is we have the first derivative. So let's take the first derivative. So we have the first derivative as this, and we can now derive it again to get the second derivative. So f double prime of x is equal to 3 times 2, which is 6. And we have x, 2 minus 1 is just 1. We can leave it like that. Then minus 10. Okay, then we have is equal to 0. So we equate in the second derivative with 0, and we have 6x minus 10. Because the 10 is negative, I'll take it over. So 10 is equal to 6x. And then we can divide both sides of the equation by 6. And therefore, x is equal to, notice 2 is common in both. So 10 divided by 2 is 5. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So your x value of the point of inflection is 5 over 3. Okay, now that we know that, we can go back and look at the graph so that we can find this. So let me get rid of all of this. Okay, so wherever the point of inflection is, the x value is 5 over 3. So let's say it was here. I know the x value is 5 over 3. They want to know where it is concave down. It's curved down here. So let's highlight that. It's curved down all the way here. And now let's mark these coordinates. Let's group these coordinates to the x-axis and see the relationship between those coordinates, those x values, and this 5 over 3. So since the graph is marked over here, I'm saying that I have a point here. If I line it up to the x-axis, I have this. If I line this point to the x-axis, it's over here. Look at the x value here. Keep lining it down. And now we have to see what is the relationship between these x values that we keep getting for the highlighted part of the graph and 5 over 3. These are values that are what than 5 over 3? These are values that are smaller than 5 over 3. They move into the left. So this is where x is less than 5 over 3. That would be your answer, where x is less than 5 over 3. That would be the values of x for which your graph will be concave down. So we just conclude this is where x is less than 5 over 3. And that's the end of question 8. So now we move on to the last question in this video, question 9. Okay, so question 9 says, in the figure below, triangle ABE, so this triangle ABE, has a base of x meters. The base and the perpendicular height of the triangle add up to 10 meters. Okay, that is a very important point. So the base, which they called x, and the height add up to 10 meters. Okay, then they say the triangle is mounted on a rectangle BCDE, which has a perimeter of 32 meters. Okay, so we have two shapes here. 
9.1 show that the area of the figure A, B, C, D, E, so the entire figure, is equal to all of this. And it's in meters squared because it's area. Okay, so with this, we have to construct some equations, first of all. Let's deal with the shapes separately. Since they spoke about, we can see that there's two shapes here, a triangle and a rectangle. So I'm going to make two columns for the triangle and the rectangle. And let's figure out what's going on here. Okay, so let's see what they say about each of these shapes. So first of all, we're actually told something about the triangle. The base is X meters. And then they say that the base and the perpendicular height, so X and H, they add up to 10 meters. So that means x plus h is equal to 10 meters. That's the equation that we have here. So remember, we have to find the area of this whole shape. So to find the area of the triangle, the area of a triangle is equal to a half times the base times the height. So we're going to use this formula. So a half times the base times the height, and we know, okay, so we have a half times, we know the base is x, and the height is h, so times x times h. Now the thing about this is, if you look at the final answer we should have, notice that it does not have any h in it. So it means we need to create an equation for h using the information they gave us about the triangle. So you need to make h the subject here. So making h the subject, we leave h on this side we're going to take the x over. So this is equal to, we still have the 10, then minus x. So a new equation of h is 10 minus x. So we'll put this in place of h. But because we have a half times x, I'm just going to multiply those. A half times x is like saying it's the numerator of 1 times the x, which is x over 2, then multiply by h. Because this is two terms, I'm just going to put in brackets and say 10 minus x in place of h. Then we can multiply this in. So multiplying the x over 2 in, we're going to get uh, 10x over 2. And then the x over 2 multiplied by negative x is going to give us a negative x squared over 2. And this can be simplified further. So we can leave it as 10 divided by 2 is 5. So that's 5x. And then this we can write it as, just so that we have a number, in front of the x squared is an invisible one. So you can write this as minus a half x squared. Okay, so that is the area of the triangle. Okay, now let's go ahead and find the area of the rectangle. So the rectangle, let's see what they told us about it. First of all, because this triangle is being mounted onto this rectangle, Notice that the base of the triangle and the length of the rectangle are exactly the same. They're both x. But also remember, because this is a rectangle, it means the opposite sides are equal. So if this is x, we can also call the opposite side x. Now, to make this easy, we can also just call this something else. So I can call bc, you can call it y. So we can say let, we're going to let bc, but I'm also just going to state that I made cd equal to x so cd is also equal to x and now i'm going to also just say i'm going to let this bc be equal to y okay so if this is y because it's a rectangle it would mean that ed is also y then there was something else they told us about the perimeter of the rectangle they said that bcd is a rectangle which has a perimeter of 32 meters they told us the perimeter of this rectangle. To find the perimeter of a rectangle or any shape, you really just add all the sides together. So if we added all these sides together, that means we're just saying it's the side BE, which is X. So I'm saying that X, and then it's the side that, which is plus Y, then again, plus another X, plus the Y, that is the perimeter, and we're going to make that equal to 32, since that is the perimeter. Okay, so again, you don't have any y in this equation. We just called one of the sides y. So we're going to just make y the subject. So if we have x plus x, that gives you 2x. 
y plus y that gives you positive 2y is equal to 32 and this is all in meters so we can make the 2y the subject by making this 32 and then we take the 2x over and becomes a negative 2x and then to make y the subject we can divide both sides of the equation by 2 and then we have that y is equal to 32 divided by 2 16 negative 2x divided by 2 is negative x okay so that's what we have as y that's what we have as this over here that is the 16 minus x now okay so to find the area of this shape it's a rectangle so to find the area of a rectangle it is just the length multiplied by the breadth so the length of this is x the breadth of this is y which is really just 16 minus x so we're going to say the area of B, C, D, E, that that is equal to our length multiplied by our breadth, so which is just X multiplied by 16 minus X. So you can write it like this, X multiplied by 16 minus X, since 16 minus X has two terms. Then if we expand this, we're going to get a 16 X and then a negative X squared as the area of the shape. Okay, so now we have the areas of these two shapes separately so to find the area of the entire shape we would just add the areas of the two shapes together so the area of a b c d e is going to be it's going to be the area of the triangle which is this so that is the 5x minus a half x squared plus this one which is 16x minus x squared and of course I don't need brackets because we're adding not subtracting if you're subtracting you put brackets because it will definitely change the signs okay so let's put our like terms together the x and the x are like terms so positive 5 plus 16x that is a 21x and then we have the negative a half x minus x so you can put that on the calculator as negative a half minus one which will give you a negative three over two x squared okay and that's what we have as the area of this and if you compare to their answer they clearly just put this one first the one with the x squared first so we can also just write it in that form we can go ahead and say this is therefore equal to negative 3 over 2x squared and the 21x is positive so plus 21x and of course it's area so it is in meters squared all of this is in meters squared okay so that's the first question 9.1 and it was for five marks the next question we move on to 9.2 so the next question 9.2 they say determine the value of x for which a b c d e has a maximum area so they only want the value of x okay so just the value of x not the actual maximum area the value of x for which it has a maximum area remember if you look at the equation for the area of a b c d e just look at the kind of graph it forms it has an x squared and an x so it's going to form a parabola. But notice the coefficient of x squared is negative. So it's going to form a concave down parabola. And what they want you to do is to find the x value belonging to this maximum value. Notice the maximum value of this parabola. It will always be the turning point because that is the highest value that this parabola is going to reach. That is your turning point. And so to find that, they just want, they don't want you to actually find the maximum value. They just want the X value that belongs to that maximum value. So I don't know what it is yet, but if we were finding it and let's say it was here, this would be, this is your X axis. This would be the X value belonging to it. Then we would still be able to find the Y value, but we only have to concentrate on the X value right now. Okay, because this is speaking about a maximum, a turning point, the turning point at the turning point, your gradient is equal to zero because it's a stationary point. It's neither increasing nor decreasing. So we're going to take the equation of this, the area of this, and we're going to find the gradient by deriving this and then setting it equal to zero because that way you're making the gradient equal to zero. 
So because it's the area, I'm just going to call the equation a of x is equal to, and let me just rewrite the equation. And now we're going to derive this. So a prime of x is equal to, and we're saying it's the negative 3 over 2 multiplied by 2. So negative 3 over 2 multiplied by 2. The 2s would cancel and you're left with negative 3x and then 2 minus 1 is 1. Of course, you can do this on the calculator as well. And then we have plus 21 and that x would fall away. Okay, so this is the derivative. This is the gradient of this function at any point. But we specifically want where the gradient is equal to zero because the gradient is only equal to zero at the turning point, which is the maximum value. Zero is equal to negative 3x plus 21. Now we can take the negative 3x over and that becomes a 3x is equal to 21. Divide both sides by 3, x is equal to 21 divided by 3 is 7. So remember, they only asked for the, you to determine the x value for which that will have a maximum area. That is the x value for which it will have a maximum area because this graph was concave down. Okay, and then moving on to the last question in question 9. And now 9.3, they say, hence, determine the maximum area of that shape, A, B, C, D, E. So here we only found the X value belonging to that maximum area. The maximum area itself is the Y value, okay, belonging to this X value. So we can take this X value and substitute it into the original function because we just want the y value. The y value will tell you the area, okay, belonging to that x value. So we're going to take this and substitute it into the original, not the derived equation. So here is the equation and we're going to substitute in place of x, we're substituting seven. Okay, and we get, so a of seven is equal to 147 over two, but because it's area, you can go ahead and just put it in decimal. So in decimal form, it is just 73.3 and it is area. So you can say meters squared. Okay, likewise, the seven is actually seven meters. That's the X value because X actually was speaking about one of the dimensions, which was the base of the triangle and also the length of the rectangle. So that is the last question. That's your final answer. And that's it for this video. So I hope to see you in the next video, which is question 10 on probability.